All right, let's get this show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1207. We were in the middle of something last time, so let's just jump right back into it. All right. Awesome. Now we're seeing our screen. So let's just do a quick recap of what we did last time. Um, so yeah, we finished all of these essentially. So we know how to deal with um, integration of trig functions, generally speaking, or at least everything I would reasonably ask you to do. Um, so we know how to integrate you know, products of sines and cosine, products of secants and tangents, and more general functions involving sines and cosines and secants and tangents. Um, if you are, I suppose we'd have to deal with a situation about what if you're in, um, you know, mixture among all these, like, the, you know, sines and cosines and secants and tangents all in one problem. I'd probably recommend just change everything to sines and cosines and use one of those um, tricks, right? So. Um, you can actually mix and match these as well. Um, but you know how to deal with sines and cosines, secants and tangents. Um, and the idea is pretty much the strategy focuses around um, either in the case where everyone is even applying the double angle formula. But if there is anyone odd among you, <laughs> um, what you would do is you try to isolate something so that you can get like a substitution in there. And that thing that you isolated is the du. So that was basically the idea behind it all. But then we went into something a little bit more sophisticated. So we started section 7.3, which is trig substitution. So this is um, like substitution on steroids, where we don't just plug in a u for something or a single variable for something, but we actually replace our variable with a trig function. And the idea is, by doing that, we can take what we know from certain trig identities to simplify certain things. So we have learned that if you have an expression like a squared minus x squared, you can actually replace the variable, here x is representing whatever variable your problem is in, um, by a sine function, a sine theta. And that will allow you to actually simplify things because your a squared minus x squared will become a squared cosine theta. So it takes a sum of things, compresses it into a single trig function, which will allow you to use the methods that we learned in the previous section. Similarly, if you have an expression like a squared plus x squared, you can replace your x with a tangent function that will simplify things. If you have x squared minus a squared, you can replace your x with a secant function and that will simplify things. And we saw a couple examples of actually using that. So something like this, and again, we're not going to forget, every time we see a new integral, we go through that same process in our heads. Just because I'm teaching you a new technique doesn't mean all that goes out the window. Can I try, is it a basic rule? Can I simplify it to be a basic rule? Would a regular substitution work? Just your plain old u equals, or u squared equals, or u cubed equals, or something like that. Would a plain old substitution work? You always think of those things first. Now, in the event that that doesn't work, then you can think about something else like integration by parts or trig substitution. Now, trig substitution comes into play when one of these expressions are in your integrand and you've exhausted all other options. Like, you know, uh, it's not a basic rule. You can't really simplify anything. A regular substitution doesn't seem to help. Maybe even you might even thought of integration by parts for a little bit, but that seems like crazy. But then you notice an expression like one of these three expressions here, then you can think about trig substitution. So here's one where I actually had a prior discussion as to why a regular substitution wouldn't work on a guy like that. He's actually very similar to this guy. And a, substitu a regular substitution just wouldn't work. And so we could do a trig substitution. And the idea is that actually simplifies it into a trig function. In this case, that very nasty integrals simplified into a relatively simple trig function that we know exactly how to deal with. Apply the double angle formula and we can do that. One thing with trig substitution though, there's an extra process that comes into play when you want to do the back substitution. So remember back substitution just means um, you're going from the variable where you have your answer 
back to the original variable in which the problem was asked of you, right? Uh, when it comes to trig sub, your answer might have trig functions in it, and you have to kind of undo those trig functions to get back to the original variable. Um, this is straightforward, though it can take a little bit of time and be a little bit annoying, and we're going to talk about when you can avoid this. But for now, we know how to actually set up our triangles and applying Sokatoa. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, tangent is opposite over adjacent. We can use this to set up a triangle, and we can figure out all our trig functions based on this triangle and kind of swap out our answers that way. So... In this case, we had our answer as theta minus one half sine two theta times two. And it turns out from this, we could figure out sine and cosine, which means we can figure out sine of two theta, which means um, this expression in this case. And that allows us to write our answer, which was in terms of theta. We can now write it in terms of x, which was the original variable. And we did more of the same. So I left a bunch of examples for you guys to try. We actually did a couple. Another one was very similar very simple, quote unquote, it was deriving a form that we can, should really know by heart, right? The integral of one over one plus x squared dx equals 10 inverse of x plus c. Um, we did one which was a little bit more messy, but again, we got a relatively simple trig integral, right? So look at that messy thing, which, you know, can't simplify a regular substitution is not going to work. It's just messy all around. Integration by parts, what would your parts even be here, honestly? But because I saw that x squared minus 3, that allows me to think of it as an x squared minus a squared. And again, your a doesn't have to be an integer. It could be a radical, as it is in this case. Think of the 3 as the radical of 3 squared. Anyway, we ended up with a single simple integral. We got an answer, and that would be the antiderivative. So I left a bunch for you guys to try, which brings us to... Today's class, finally. Okay, so last time we learned about trig substitution, we're going to get through a bunch of examples. So we're gonna finish this today. Uh, we're also going to start a whole other technique, uh, which is partial fraction, should be a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, that's, that's probably all we would get through today because not only do I have to teach you this new technique, I like giving you lots of examples because integration as I'm sure you're all aware now, it kind of it's messy, you know, it's not as straightforward as differentiation. So I like giving a lot of examples here. So let's look at this one. Um, so what did you guys try here? What do you think uh, we could use for the approach here? I made the denominator x plus two squared uh, plus four, all under a square root. And then- Right, so that's uh, what you did is completing the square. So that is an option. Now, when you have a general quadratic, remember there is a method called completing the square, which you would have learned in algebra two class, algebra class. I don't really know what the difference between those two are. <laughs> You'd learn in algebra class. You probably redid it or relearned it in pre-calculus class as well, you have to remember that's gonna be a running theme for today because to teach you the next method, we're going to have to revisit pre-calc and algebra. But yeah, there is something called completing the square and that's what we can do here. So this is X plus two. Remember that two is going to be half of this four and you square it. Um, so there's a method to complete the square, but you can actually sort of eyeball it. You understand that if you expand this, you would get an x squared plus 4x plus 4. And you know, originally you had an 8. So to maintain that, obviously, you would need to add another 4 here. So um, you can just take x plus half the coefficient of the linear term, put that all in a square, you'll know what the constant term is because it's just gonna be the square of the last guy. And then you kind of figure out what you have to add or subtract from that to get back the original constant. So this, uh, what we did here was uh, complete the square. And that is nice because that actually gets us looking like um, the form that we need, you know, like an X squared plus an A squared where in this case, your a equals two. 
So that's actually a very nice thing here. So that's another option that you should be aware of. If you're given a general quadratic, you can always write it in one of these forms that was mentioned in the table here. All right. So pretty much any quadratic, you can actually get it into one of these forms using completing the square. So that should be something you're aware of. So you don't have to exactly have these. A lot of times you will, but this method can still work if you have like a general quadratic equation, like with three terms in. All you do is complete the square. Okay, so that's the first thing. All right, so elaborated a lot there, but all right. So we complete the square, we get here. Let's not forget our dx. Then, uh, yeah, so your next thing was? I actually did it a little differently than you did in the table. I didn't use a tan theta. I constructed the triangle and I saw that the entire denominator would be equal to two secant theta. So I made that substitution and it seemed to simplify the work a lot uh, from the work that you would have to do if you just made an X substitution for a tan theta. Right, but I mean, if you, what you're doing is essentially the trig sub. Um, it's just that you kind of saw it more intuitively as opposed to going through the formulas. So you you would end up with the secant just as you said, but the method of trig substitution is just kind of streamlining that and giving you like an algorithm for getting there. So yeah, it, it's essentially gonna be the same thing. And the triangle you constructed would essentially be the same triangle you would construct to do the back substitution. So, um, you're essentially doing trig sub, but you just skipped some of the steps. So for the um, interest of, you know, keeping everyone on the same page, I'll probably just write out the trig sub. But yeah, this is the form of a tangent. So in this case, though, our variable is x plus 2, not just x, so I just set x plus 2 equals 2 tan theta because right, that's our x in this case. And so you differentiate your dx would be uh, 2 through tangent is secant squared. And then you're going to actually plug this in. Let's call this i. Okay, um, so, I have a question. Yes? So why do you go, uh, when you write the substitution, after you complete the square, you have x2 plus a2 equal, and a is equal to 2. Why do you just go straight to x plus 2? Is it just because you're going straight, you're getting rid of the squares? Yeah, because we know that in the ex, in the, the form that we need is x squared plus a squared, and that leads to x equals a tan theta, right? But here, your x, like this guy, is not just an x, right? It's actually, in place of x, you have this entire expression. So we ha actually have x plus 2 here. So everywhere I see x, I would put x plus 2. Right, so the x is, it's, it's generalized here. It's a linear function. So we don't just have x squared plus four, in which case we would let x equals two than theta. We have x plus two squared plus four. So the x plus two, you just think of as your variable. Okay. Now, of course, right, that would leave you with, um, we know that tan squared plus one gives us secant squared. That's gonna leave us with a, a squared secant squared here and our dx is that guy. So now what happens is you're going to have why did I do that? Now what happens you're going to have this guy would simplify to two secant theta times two secant squared theta d theta. Um, which two cancels two, this this cancels that. And we're left with a secant theta, d theta, right? So now we've caught up to maxim, but, um, right? 
So if you could figure this out by drawing a triangle, you can actually show that in your work, but this is a more algorithmic way I think is easier for most people to follow. And I mean, if you know what you're doing, you can do write this out relatively quickly. It's not like you're losing a lot of time here, a minute or two minutes, it's not gonna be an issue. So we end up with the integral of secant, which at this point, we actually know what that is, right? That's going to be ln of secant plus tangent, right? So that is the answer. That is the antiderivative. That is the integral in terms of theta. But our original problem wasn't asked in terms of theta, so we have to do the back substitution. So we know that our x plus two, you know, we know that our x plus two was equal to two tan theta, as soon as the x plus two over two equals tan theta. This means the triangle in question here is going to be opposite over adjacent. And then this will be the square root of, you know, this guy plus that guy. Also notice that this is actually the original if you wanted to think of it that way. This is the x squared plus four x plus eight. That was the original. And yeah, so from this, I know I can get the secant. I know that my, I already know what the tangent is. Tangent is the x plus two over two. And from this, I can take my secant, which is going to be hypotenuse over adjacent. So it's the x squared plus four x plus eight all over two. And so I can put that into my ln. It's x plus two all over two plus the radical of x squared plus four x plus eight all over two plus c, which you can uh, actually simplify this a little bit just to make it look nicer, x plus two. Right, like that. And that's our uh, integral. Any questions here? Okay, so this one is uh, similar as well. You see it's essentially a sum of squares. Um, so that's gonna also give you a tangent, but the trick here, if you can call it that, you just think of this as two X squared plus one squared. So at this point you just set two X equals one tan theta. So you have two DX, equals secant squared theta d theta. So this means that your integral, which we're calling i, is essentially um, put one half out here, secant squared theta d theta, and that's your dx. Then underneath that, I would just end up with essentially secant 
squared theta. Just heard like a error message. What was that about? Too? Can you guys hear me okay? Can you guys say something to make sure I can hear you? Hello. Hello, hello. Hi. I can hear you. The error was something happened to the audio. Can you try again? Hello. I can hear you. Okay, I can hear you. All right. I don't know what that was about. Okay, so that's my dx. That would end up being secant squared because that 2x squared plus 1 would essentially be a tangent squared plus 1. And so once again, this whole thing would essentially cancel out one of those secants. And I would have one half secant theta. Integral of that is one half ln of secant theta tangent theta. I'm going to get that triangle where tangent is opposite over adjacent. So this would be your 4x squared plus 1. And so this means that my secant theta is um, hypotenuse over adjacent and tan theta is just 2x. So this means my final answer is that guy. I'm confused on how you knew to how you knew to plug in the secant squared theta in the um, denominator when you first did the i equals. Okay, so there are a couple ways. One is from this table that I gave you yesterday. You kind of know that's what's going to end up happening, right? So I know that my a squared plus x squared will always end up looking like an a squared secant squared. So I can literally just plug that in. Okay. So that's, that's, that's one way to do it. The other way is to actually, if you literally just plug it in on the spot, right? So if your 2x is actually a tangent, that would actually give you 10 theta squared plus 1, which you actually know is secant squared theta. And it's plugged in right there. Okay. But but something like that is always going to happen. So you can actually do the plugins yourself. So even here, earlier, if I actually plugged in two tan theta for my x plus two, and added four to it, then that would look like four tangent squared theta plus four. I could factor out a four to get 10 squared theta plus one. And of course that would give me secant squared theta, which is what and here. Okay. Right? So you yeah. can actually plug it in and calculate them. Or, I mean, if you know this table that I gave you, you can know what's going to happen. Like you don't have to go through the calculations because they were sort of already gone through for you. Like once you apply the right trig sub, this is how your expressions will end up, right? You can always just 
jump to the next step and replace them by these guys. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Now this one is just another, obviously another tangent one because it's the sum of squares x squared plus one. Um, so we start off pretty much how you expect. X equals one tan theta because your A is one here. Your DX is gonna be secant squared theta D theta. So when you go and plug these in, your dx is going to be secant squared theta d theta. Um, here, though, we're going to have in the parentheses, we're going to end up with secant squared theta, again, by the methods that we've done before. And this leaves us with, in the denominator, secant cubed. This, of course, gives us 1 over secant. How do we integrate one over secant? We can simplify to integral of cosine. Mm -hmm. One over secant is cosine. Integral of that is sine. So now we're going to do that back substitution. We know that x over 1 was tangent. So it's x over 1. It's going to be the square root of x squared plus 1. This means that your sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. And so your final answer is going to be x over the square root of x squared plus 1. So I'm just trying to get in here. So that's that one. Okay. So the three halves power is something that was weird, but you go to trig sub, it's not that bad. It ended up just being like the equivalent to the integral of cosine. Right. Here we have a definite integral. Definite integral just means we have like limits on the integration. So this is definitely thought interpreted geometrically as, you know, the net area under a curve. So whatever the graph of this looks like, we're looking at the area under the curve, bounded between the curve and the x-axis between x equals radical three and x equals two. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, the back substitution, sometimes it can be annoying. You have to go to this triangle, you set things up, you have to figure out what the trig functions in your answer are. However, 
whenever there is a definite integral, we can actually bypass that by actually figuring out what those specific values are in the theta world. And with that, we avoid needing to go with the back substitution because then we don't need to get back to X to find the answer. Like if we have the answer in theta and we know the limits in terms of theta, we can just plug those guys in. So um, this provides an opportunity. Uh, so let's actually, um, go with that. So here, we're going to do a trig substitution. This guy is what we're going to base our substitution on. That's the expression that looks like something that we need for trig substitution. Now, it's also worth mentioning that this integral, we can uh, figure out how to do it another way, but I think I would have to teach you the next technique before I teach you how to do this another way. For now, the only thing we have to be able to deal with this would be like a, a trig sub. So uh, we have x squared minus a squared. Again, think of the three as radical three squared. So we have the x squared minus a squared term. So what's the trig substitute for that? Right, you see x would be equal to a, what's the trig function? Sine beta. No, like a trig function squared minus a constant, right? So remember they're, 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 um, there are three expressions that we're modeling this off of. One minus sine theta gives us cosine theta. Uh, one minus sine squared gives us cosine squared. We also have tan squared theta plus one giving us secant squared. And we also have secant squared theta. Minus one giving us uh, tangent squared. Right. So this guy is like, you think of this as the constant minus some function squared. This guy you think as the function minus plus some constant squared. This guy you think of as like your function minus some constant, right? So the one in your trig identity replaces the A. Because if I just multiply both sides of these equations by A, I get the version of these equations with A in it. You get A squared a squared you get a squared minus a sine theta all squared would give us the a squared cosine theta so if you're trying to think of which trig function to use eventually if you practice enough problems you'll remember it automatically but if you forget um, what you want to do is you want to think of these pythagorean identities remember it's one minus sine squared so it's the constant minus the function so a squared minus x squared that's the sine right if you have the x squared plus a squared. It's it's the function plus the constant. So that's going to be the tangent squared plus the one. Um, if you have the function minus a constant, right? So that's your secant squared minus the constant would give you the tangent squared. So this is actually a secant. Because you're now thinking of it becoming three secant squared minus three. You can factor out the three. You get three times secant squared minus one. That's going to collapse into a tangent. 
squared. So your dx is going to be secant tangent d theta. OK, so now um, what we're going to do is we're going to change the limits. And at this point, I'm going to make a very strong recommendation to always do this, always change the limits when doing a definite integral by trig sub. Save sign. Okay, this actually allows us to avoid the back substitution. You're going to see. Um, you're going to see how this works out. So when um, you don't, you're not doing a trig sub. You're just doing a regular uh, definite integral. It was always kind of optional if you wanted to change the limits or not. Um, you know, it, you don't really save much time either way in practice. I find without this. But for trig sub, you definitely save time because you don't have to go through this whole back substitution process. You just need to know how trig functions behave at the points where you already should know how they behave at. Because um, they're always going to be the nice numbers for the values where you already know what the values of the trig functions are. And then once you do that, you don't have to worry about back substitution anymore because now everything is in terms of your variable theta. You're going to get a constant answer at the end. It doesn't matter if you plugged in x's to get it or thetas to get it, you'll get the right answer. So how do we change the limits? Um, in case you didn't remember, recall, we change limits using our substitution equation. So changing the limits, what does that mean? It means this one third and this two, those are answers in, those are constants in terms of x's. I want to change them to be in terms of thetas. How do I change them? I'm going to use my original substitution equation. That is the equation that tells me how x's relate to thetas. So, so we know that um, x, So we know that x over rad three is equal to secant. Um, in other words, can you explain that one more time? Why we put it in terms of theta? Oh, you're actually going to see at the end. I'm going to show you why it's useful. Okay, and now, and and so you you'll you'll actually see it. Oh yeah, I see why we're going to do that. But for now, just just. Uh, Take my word on it that we want to change the limits to thetas. Um, so let's say this is this would be cosine. Okay. So using my original equation, I just rewrote it because it's nice. Nice to rewrite. Right, because of Sokotoa, everyone knows things in terms of cosine as opposed to secant. So now what you do is you're going to plug in each of these numbers for x and figure out what the theta is. So you know um, when x equals 2, this means that rad 3 over 2 is equal to cosine theta, which means um, theta equals the cosine of what angle gives you rad 3 over 2. Power over six. Power over six, right? We had that in that table that we did, right? Sine goes one, two, three. Cosine goes three, two, one. So you want the first column where the cosine, the numerator, has a three in it. And that happens at 30 degrees, which is pi over six. So your theta is going to be pi over six. 
And then you do when x equals uh, rad three. So this is changing the top limit when x equals two. And then I'm changing the bottom limit when x equals rad three. So here I'm changing the top limit. Here I'm changing the bottom limit. So when x equals rad three, I get rad three over rad three gives us cosine. And of course, this means one is equal to cosine. Where is cosine one? Well, when theta equals zero. So now we can go here and plug in what our integral would be. So if I call this i, I'm going to start plugging these in. Now, the limits were here, your x equals radical 3 and your x equals 2. But I've changed those limits now to be in terms of theta. So instead of going from rad 3 to 2, I'm going to go from 0 to pi over 6. Because now, I want the limits in terms of thetas. And other than that, I'm going to just carry on as usual. So I know in this case, if I plug in x equals uh, rad 3 secant theta, what's under that radical is going to end up being 3 secant squared minus 3, which ends up going to be 3 tangent squared. So I'm going to end up with uh, 3 10 squared under the radical. In the denominator, I have x, and my x is rad 3 secant. Then I have my dx, and my dx is rad 3 secant 10. So when I go and I plug everything in, that's what I'm going to get. Now we start uh, doing some cancellation. So this cancels that. The secant cancels that secant. What I'm going to have left here is there's going to be a rad 3. And there's going to be a tangent left over. So in other words, I end up with uh, rad, th rad 3 integral from 0 to pi over 6 of tangent squared theta d theta. Now, how do we integrate tangent squared? I believe this is one of those ones I um, tell you guys how to do at the beginning of our secant 10, the tricks of the uh, 7.2. We looked how to integrate tangent, we looked how to integrate secant, we looked how to integrate tangent squared. What was the method here? Ideas for integrating tangent squared?
what we'll do is apply a trig identity, lambda squared secant squared minus one. And so turns out that we know the integral of secant squared, that's just tangent. And we know the integral of one, which is just theta with respect to theta. And we have our limits here, zero to pi over six. And here, um, we now, those are thetas. We can literally just plug it in for theta. So we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so we'll plug in theta, we get pi over six, minus pi over six, minus plug in zero, minus zero. Of course, tan of zero is zero, zero is zero. So we don't have to worry about that. Tangent of pi over six, what's that? Well, that's gonna be uh, one over at three. Because we know sine of pi over six is a half. Cosine of pi over six is rad three over two. You take a half divide by rad three over two, the twos cancel, you just get one over rad three. So you end up with rad three times one over rad three minus pi over six. So that would be the integral after you plugged it in, change the limits, we would have that. So now to go back to the question of, well, why are you so adamant about us changing the limits? Like, why couldn't we just keep the limits and avoid doing that thing? Well. Imagine if you got here on this line and you hadn't changed the limits, right? So So you would essentially have rad three um, times tan theta minus theta between x equals rad three and x equals two, right? Now, what would you have to do in order to plug in the x values? Well, you have to figure out what x's are, right? You can't plug in the two and the rad three into theta because theta is not rad two and rad three. The x's were two and rad three. So what you would have to do is you'd have to go back and be like, okay, I need to figure out what X is in order to do this. So I know that my X was rad three secant theta. This means my X over rad three was secant theta. Uh, this means rad three over X is gonna be cosine. So then I can set up this triangle. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. This is gonna be your x squared minus three. Then now I'm gonna to have to figure out that the tangent then is going to be opposite over adjacent. And also that my theta is going to be a secant or is going to be a cosine inverse of rad three over X. And so then I'm gonna to have to come back here and plug that in. So then I'm gonna have rad three times the tangent, which was like the square root of X squared minus three over rad three minus the theta, which is a cosine inverse of rad three over X. And now I'm finally at the position where I can plug in rad three and two for X and then the plugin starts, right? 
So you think of this compared to, we literally didn't have to do anything, but just plug in, right? So you see like plugging in, like changing the limits, just doing these simple calculations here, which you're gonna have memorized anyway, it avoids you so much work to go from this line to this next line. Um, because you don't have to go and figure out, oh, well, this is a triangle, do this, and these are the functions. And then, okay, now after doing the triangle and Sokoto and all that, I can plug in the numbers. It's like, no, just do it so that you can plug in the numbers right away. Like you actually get exactly the same answer, right? With a lot less work, right? You plug in two here, you get four minus three, which gives you the one over the radical three, which yeah, we, we got the one over radical three, but we got it without having to set up triangles and figuring out all this other stuff, right? So that's kind of why. So it's just uh, more work takes longer. So trig substitution is a powerful method, but the drawback is there's this whole process you have to go through for back substitution, and it can get kind of annoying. And so when if you can avoid it, you can, you do, right? You avoid that process when you can. It's not like it's crazy math or anything. It's it's trig, just like you learned in pre-cal. But you know, after going through all the calculus, who wants to end up going through a bunch of trig problems on top of that? Like, like nobody, right? You do it when you have to. Like, you, you know, you have the answer in theta, you need it in X. Okay, I have to go through this. But if there are limits on your integral, you don't have to go through it. Um, you just change all the limits of thetas. Once you get the answer in thetas, you can plug in the numbers right away. There's no need to go and figure out from the triangle what these functions should be in terms of X so I can plug in the X numbers. So hopefully that... Uh, kind of uh, justifies to you why I'm being all dramatic here. Like, always, always do this. Ah. Right, it's just trying to save you time. So that was the answer for the last one. How many more problems do we have? One, two, three. I think we'll do a break here. Try those three uh, G H I. I think that's the name of an insurance company, but okay. So we'll pick up with GHI um, when we return. So we're gonna take a five minute break right now. Also take attendance during that time and uh, see you guys in about five minutes. Uh, all right, yeah, had some technical difficulties there. My laptop spazzed out, gave me that whole blue screen of death thing. <laughs> had to wait until it did its thing and restarted. Um, but I think we are back up. So got an extra long break. So you guys are extra fresh. Um, let's get into it. We're going to finish up with these three and then switch gears. Um, so ideas for this one. want to waste too much more time but the another the, the we're gonna do the completing the square trick again so just remember to complete the square the coefficient of the square term needs to be positive one so if it has any other coefficients we need to actually factor them off first And so you remember in the complete square, so remember in a complete square, 
the linear, the, uh, the constant term must be half the coefficient of the linear term. So you look at the linear term, you take x plus half of that all squared. And then you realize that when you multiplied that out, you would get a plus four constant, but the original did not have a constant term. So you have to subtract that four. So what we did here was complete the square. And then um, I can multiply that out. So now it looks like four minus x plus two all squared. So this reminds me of the a squared minus x squared form. Um, so it looks like uh, a squared minus x squared, where your x is x plus two and your a is two. So I'm going to do, I know this is reminding me of one minus sine squared. So sine squared is going to be the guy. So x plus two is equal to a sine theta. So this means that your dx is going to be cosine theta d theta. And we're going to plug that in. So this is my pi once again. So now the denominator is going to become two uh, a squared cosine squared. So it's under the radical. So it's four cosine squared. The dx is going to be two cosine squared, uh, two cosine theta d theta. Well, this I think actually cancels that whole thing. So it's just the integral of one d theta. And so that's actually theta plus c. But here we can actually find theta relatively easy. It's just going to be the arc sine. Which I mean, you might notice that this is actually in the form of an arc sine to begin with. If you look at, um, like when you were at this point, And if you were to just do a regular, say, u sub, this would become the integral of 2 squared minus u squared du. And if you look at, where is that? Yeah, uh, basic rule number 18, you can see that that's directly uh, an arc sign. Um, but of course, if you didn't remember that, you could use trig sub and you can figure those out. In fact, all the inverse trig function thingies that you see here, you could actually rederive them using trig sub. So they actually have those forms that you're looking for. Um, so like the a squared minus x squared, the x squared plus a squared, you know, x squared minus a squared, these are all forms that come in handy when you're looking at um, trig substitution. Then apply uh, basic rule 18. So at this point, if you memorize the inverse trig formulas, uh, you could actually just apply that directly here. It's actually in a nice form. Um, 
if you didn't have a one on top or something like that, then yeah, trig substitution becomes way more necessary. But uh, this is a relatively nice one. Being said, anything that would end up as a basic rule, the integral itself isn't going to be that hard. So don't beat yourself up if you didn't see something like that, because the, the, the actual trig sub is always going to be like a one. It's going to be like a constant or something where theta is your answer and your theta is just going to be the inverse trig function of whatever your original trig sub was. You're not going to waste too much time. But when you see an answer like this, where it's the, the answer is just like an inverse trig function, chances are if there was a basic rule that you didn't apply, but yeah, it's not going to kill you too much to go through it. So that was that one. Um, this one is not so straightforward because of the X on the top. Um, but uh, what would you guys uh, think of doing here? So this is an integral where um, if you encountered this guy on a quiz or a test or something like that, um, trig sub would not be what you do. This is a, an integral where a u sub could work, a regular substitution. Um, so that's actually the better way. So, I mean, you, you could do trig sub, And we can go through it just um, for you to see how that would look, but I would not recommend doing that. So your x would be 2 sine theta. And this would under that become 4 cosine squared theta your dx would be 2 cosine theta d theta. This guy would cancel with all of that. So you'd end up with 2 times the integral of sine theta d theta, which would be minus 2 cosine theta plus c. And then what you would do is you try to figure out what is cosine. Well, I know what the sine is. The sine is x over 2. opposite over hypotenuse. This here is going to be the 4 minus x squared. So this would mean that your cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. And so the answer would ultimately be minus the radical of 4 minus x squared. Okay, but that would not be what you do. The better thing to do. Um, it's just a, a regular substitution. So something like u squared is equal to 4 minus x squared. So you go in, and this would essentially be um, u du over, well, u, so just integrate 1 du, so you just get, see, this is a minus here, it's minus x squared, minus 
minus u plus c, and your u is the square root of four minus x squared. So much better. Um, so with the trig sub, um, you could do it, but a uh, regular substitution would be better. And this is why we always think through that kind of hierarchy, right? So we always go with uh, you know, the basic rule. Can I simplify? Would a regular substitution work? Because whenever this, whenever that would work, it's going to be easier than any other thing, any of the more sophisticated methods, right? Don't try to use um, a sledgehammer to kill a mosquito or anything like that. Um, so this is actually better for a regular substitution. If you look at this one, um, it might actually remind you of something that we did at the in the last lecture, which again, you'd realize that a regular substitution could work here. So, Uh, just realize that this guy is the x cubed. You can think of it as x squared times x. Um, and so do like a, uh, u equals the radical of x squared minus 3 your d uh, 2u du would give you 2x dx. In other words, your u du is equal to the x dx. So you go in and your u du replaces the x dx part. What's underneath the denominator is just a u. And what's on top is the x squared, which is just u squared plus three which you just, you know, from this, x squared is equal to u squared plus three. Here the u's would cancel. So you just have that guy, which you can integrate. And then you plug in the u, which was, in our case, x squared minus three, radical of x squared minus three. We have that. So, this uh, sort of brings up the question, all right, so when do you know um, whether a substitution would work over, say, a, a trig substitution, right? So we know that we always want to see if a, a simpler substitution, like of the order that we learned in Calc 1, would work over something like a trig substitution. and I mean, looking at these two examples here, does anyone think they can guess when that would be the case? Like, when do I really know, looking at this thing, whether a substitution would work or I need a trick substitution? Any ideas when the trig sub would be better? Because we looked at this one, x over mm -hmm. the 
yeah i think trig sub might be better when we like know that we're going to be using like cosine tan or any of the trigonometric functions and then when we just see like something that can be easily plugged in like the x3 and then the square root of the x to the second power or minus three we can really do a substitution with that because we see like that just plugs right into the equation yeah, well, how would you know that ahead of time that, oh, if I plug this in, I would get something nicer? Like, is there like a quick rule of thumb you can see? Be I do not know. Because we did, for example, maybe we did it last time. Like why wouldn't a why a, a regular substitution wouldn't work on these two, for example? And I did another one, I believe, or this. Like a regular substitution wouldn't work on this one, for example. And here I, I even sort of started to hint at why that would be the case. So the thing is, you're going to make the u the part under the radical. That is what would make most sense. And the part under the radical has x to an even power, which means when you do the derivative, um, you're going to get x to an odd power. However, if there's an even power factor of x, what's going to happen is you would have to take away one of those x's to be your du part, and you'd have an odd power of x's left. And so what would that would mean that would mess up all your um all your what your regular substitution can handle because now you're going to get radicals in places where you don't you can't deal with radicals right you'd end up with your x being this radical of a thing because you can't actually get it to an even power so the the actual rule of thumb is simple once you've seen it is the fact that I know a substitution could work because that is an odd power of x. Or I know a, sub, a regular substitution will work here because that is an odd power of x. When I look at the guy who would be the u, I look elsewhere where my x's are. If they have odd powers, a regular substitution would work. If they have even powers, a regular substitution won't. So that is actually the, uh, the rule of thumb. In fact, I will actually. So just in summary, if the numerator is an odd power, do regular sub? Yes, it actually also works in the denominator as well. So I'll actually write that down. Um, the thing is, when it's in the denominator, it can get a little bit tricky because you would likely need another technique that I haven't taught you yet. But it can also work if the odd factor is in the denominator. So. Uh, the example that we had before with x to the third power is that one of the examples where the numerator is an odd number um, also? Which one? Like um, this one, it could also work. Just like so, the most recent example. Uh, which one? What was your example? It was like uh, x to the third power over the square root of x to the second power minus three. Yeah. So a regular sub would work there because that is an odd power of x. If, if that were an x squared or an x fourth, then I would do trig sub. Or if it were a one, which is equivalent to x to the zero, which is an even power, I would do a trig sub. But the fact that that x has an odd power makes a u sub better. So let's actually write that down. Uh, to trig sub or not to trig sub. That is the question. Okay, so the rule of thumb is the following. Um, if after accounting ignoring the uh, expression
you would substitute there remains an odd an odd powered factor of of x in the numerator or denominator. Then a regular substitution can work. And you should do that. So um, some examples of when you would say do a, a trig sub versus a regular sub. So if I see something like the integral of x squared over the radical of four minus x squared dx versus I see um, x over the radical of four minus x squared dx, or I see something like x cubed over the radical of four minus x squared dx, right? Or here I would see like a, a one over, um, say x squared minus four to the three halves versus I can see like an x over x squared minus four to the three halves. Right, so line these up. Okay. So you see the idea is that um, or something like even x to the fourth over four minus x squared dx versus x to the fifth over four minus x squared dx. So the candidate, like one like eyeballing rule of thumb is if once you account for what your substitution would be, for example, it would be this. These are the expressions that you would take as your substitution. Elsewhere, you see an odd power factor of x. Um, it can also work if the x is in the denominator. So something like uh, x cubed times the radical of x squared plus 1 dx versus something like x squared times the radical of x squared plus 1 dx, right? So the fact that there, once you account for the guy you would substitute, there's an odd power elsewhere, right? So these guys are all odd powers. Once you see an odd power elsewhere, a regular substitution is going to work. Don't think trig sub. Because what you can do, you can always, it means you can always do something like this. Like once there's an odd power, you can factor off an X that once you do your substitution, that guy gets rid of. And because these are both even powers, you'd be able to solve for one in terms of the other and rewrite it. So you'd always be able to do something like this. Now, once you can do that, you're actually going to always get something that's easier to deal with um, as a regular substitution. You won't need the tricks of that. The problem is if you have an even power elsewhere, like this guy's an even power, if you went in and did your u equals four minus x squared, your du is going to get rid of one of those factors of x. So you're going to have like an X left over, which what are you going to do with that? It's going to become like a radical. And so you're going to have this radical expression on top of a radical expression, and you're not going to get anywhere better. 
Um, so the, the regular sub won't work for that. So a trig sub is very useful for situations like that. So once you get to a point where, you know, you're not in section 7.3, it's just a test where everything is thrown at you. How do you know when you should apply a trig sub versus a regular sub? And a, a nice rule of thumb is just, is there an odd power? Other than the thing I would substitute, is there an odd factor elsewhere or an even factor? There's an even factor. And of course, even factors include just a constant because one, you can think of S to the zero, which is an even number, right? So once there is an even power of X elsewhere, um, you're doing a trig sub. You don't, you don't want to worry about uh, doing a U sub. But it, as long as there is an odd power elsewhere, um, a regular substitution is a good idea. Um, with, uh, I do want to make the note with the denominator because I put an asterisk here. Um, so there's a technique called partial fractions, which uh, if the, the odd part factor is in the denominator, you might end up in a situation where you need something like partial fractions, but it'll still generally be less annoying than going through a trig sub, especially when you learn the kind of tricks that I'm going to teach you with partial fractions. Um, so what is partial fractions? Partial fractions is it's a whole other topic. It's in fact what we're going to start right now. So that is actually the next section. Yeah, so we've done everything I wanted to do for uh, trig substitution. We're going to cover uh, a technique called partial fractions or more specifically integration by partial fractions. Okay. So in terms of trig substitution, um, what's in this table is what you need to know. You need to know this table. Right. So when you see an expression like in the leftmost column, and again, you know to check, is the x's elsewhere odd or even powered? Right. So now we know if you see an expression like in this left column and the factors of x elsewhere are even, you would do a trig sub. You do the substitution that's in the middle column, and then you can set up a triangle based on that substitution, which is in the rightmost column here. And you go through the substitution you'll end up with a trig integral that you can use the techniques from 7.2 to figure out what they are. And then you'll get an answer in theta, which you can use the triangle to back substitute to get to your original variable. In the event you have a definite integral, do not waste time with the back substitution. Change the limits and just plug in the thetas directly into the answer that you would have gotten here. So, and that's essentially a trig sub. Of course, we had to go through a, a, quite a few examples to kind of hammer that home. But hopefully, after today's lecture and with a little more practice on homework, you'll kind of get uh, used to this idea of applying a trig cell. So that being said, we are going to start a new topic called partial fractions. And I want to sort of motivate where this is coming from, and then I'm going to show you how to do it. So suppose we want to compute
this integral. Let's say I ask you, oh, what is the integral of x squared minus 5x plus 6? That's the integral I want us to do, right? So now you start thinking about, okay, well, is this a basic rule? No. Can I simplify this? No. What am I going to do here? Uh, can a substitution work? What would you substitute? The obvious substitute would be the denominator, but if I substitute the x squared minus 5x plus 6, the du uh, would be 2x minus 5, and I don't have a factor of 2x minus 5 here. And even if, if I wanted to somehow artificially put that in, like what would that expression look like? So a uh, regular substitution would not work, right? So, and again, because, so, no, um, regular substitution would not work. So here's where you kind of, you bite the bullet and you're like, okay, trig sub maybe? Okay, so all right, if I'm gonna do a trig sub, then I need to make sure I have the expressions that look like x squared plus a squared or x squared minus a squared or a squared minus x squared, which means I'm gonna have to complete the square. So that would lead me to the integral that looks like, okay, okay, completing the square. All right, so this is gonna be x minus five over two squared. <laughs> and then, um, I mean, if you were to multiply this out, you'd get 25 over four here. So your what the constant term is going to be is six minus 25 over four, which is going to end up with six is 24. Uh, 24. So this is end up going to be minus a quarter, right? after completing the square. And so then you're going to have like, okay, so it's x, x minus five over two is equal to one half. It's x minus, okay, so that's gonna be a secant. And then it's like, yuck, right? So you're doing like trig sub and there are fractions all over the place. It's kind of really annoying. Like you don't want to, um, I mean, we could do it at this point, but as you're going to, after you, we learn all the techniques, you're going to start to realize that trig sub is the really like one of the worst. <laughs> like you, you kind of don't want to do it if you can avoid it. It's just one of those things that are too, too computationally heavy, right? You have this regular integral, you transform into a trig integral, and then you have to solve it. Then you have to do a back substitution by going through trig and setting up triangles and then getting the answer. It's kind of an annoying process. And sometimes you have to do it, but sometimes you actually don't. Um, so it turns out that there was actually another option here. But, Suppose you notice the following. This integral that I asked you to do, is actually equal to this integral. Oh, he, um, you guys don't look convinced. Okay, let, let's actually do it. Uh, so if I had one over X minus three minus one over X minus two, we would create a common denominator. So I multiply this by X minus two over X minus two. I would multiply this by X minus three over X minus three. Then the denominator would just be X minus two times X minus three. And the top would be x minus 2 minus x minus 3. That actually gives us 1 over x minus 2, x minus 3. If I multiply that out, I would get x squared minus 3x minus 2x plus 6. Yeah, so that these two fractions actually add up to this fraction right here. And so let's say I recognize that, right? So I look at this fraction and then I'm like, oh, that's just one over X minus three minus one over X minus two. And 
that I don't need some crazy trig sub to do. That is essentially a basic rule. Sure, you have to go through a little substitution, but it's the kind of substitution which hopefully at this point you can go through in your head and realize that that's just going to be some LNs. So if you notice this, that this fraction is actually just these two fractions combined, then the integral is actually pretty easy. And so that is essentially partial fractions. Like when you take one big fraction, you write it into a bunch of smaller fractions, and then those smaller fractions are easier to deal with. You can say that, you know, I've done what's called the partial fraction decomposition of this guy. So you look at the big fraction, notice that it's a bunch of smaller fractions, the integral is easy and that's partial fractions. Okay, great, moving on to the next section. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, we're gonna, <laughs> obviously like I'm gonna show you like how would you actually know that, <laughs> right? So it's probably not something that you might uh, know like right away unless, you know, you're one of those people with that kind of brain. Like, how would you know that that's what this fraction breaks up into? Um, and so that is the essentially the um, the goal of today's uh, lesson. So the obvious question is, um, so let me actually introduce some terminology here. So the one over X minus three minus one over X minus two is called the partial fraction uh, decomposition. Of the big guy. So when you take a big fraction and you write it in terms of smaller fractions, those fractions are called partial fractions of the original guy. And when you write a sum of these guys such that you get the bigger fraction when you add them up, you say you found the partial fraction decomposition, right? So these guys are the, the partial fractions of the big fraction, right? So you find a bunch of small fractions that are simplified as much as possible that make up the big fraction, you say you found the partial fractions. And, and once you can write this as, as a sum in the right way, you say you found the partial fractions decomposition, okay? So now um, the question is, how do we do this? How do we find? the partial fraction decomposition. Some larger rational expression. Answer. Well, uh, I typed it out. Because I, I got too lazy to, write, <laughs> to like write this all down. So I actually typed it out. So I'm just gonna paste uh, the steps in here. And I'm going to also talk about when you can kind of know that this would be a thing that you can do. Like, when is this going to be um, a viable option?
So there we go. So you don't have to write these all out and I'm gonna explain each step by step so you actually know how to go through this process. It's broken down into about four steps. Um, and I'm gonna actually go through each of them with you separately so you can know how to deal with each step and then we put it all together. But when can you actually do this? When can you have uh, do a partial fraction decomposition? There are some pre uh, uh, some conditions that you need to be fulfilled. So first of all, you need to start with a proper rational function. And what that means is that the highest the degree of the numerator must be greater. must be, well, strictly less than the degree of the denominator. Oh, I actually wrote that down. <laughs> Proper means to actually type that out. I forgot that I typed that out. Um, but now I already started writing it. Strictly less than the degree of the denominator. I'm gonna, the words bears repeating. So that's the first thing. So you need to start with a proper fraction. So if you have a cubic divided by a quadratic, you cannot find the partial fractions decomposition, right? If you have a polynomial with x to the fifth, blah, 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 and underneath it, you have a cubic, you cannot find the partial fractions decomposition. You need it to be in a certain form. You need it to have a proper format. Proper format means the highest power in the denominator must be strictly larger than the highest power in the numerator, right? These are the conditions. And the second condition is that the denominator must be factorable over the rational numbers. You should be able to, it should be something that you can factor. So if your denominator is x squared plus one, you can't find the partial fraction decomposition. You can't factor x squared plus one. At least, I mean, you can factor it over the complex numbers, but we don't deal with that. So. Yeah, you can't factor x squared plus one. However, you can factor x squared minus five x plus six. In fact, it factors into the denominators over here. X minus two times x minus three, when you expand that, is actually x squared minus five x plus six. And that actually sort of hints to you how we're actually gonna break this up. It breaks up into the factors. Each fraction is going to break up into the factors of the denominator. And that's kind of going to tell you what the new denominators of these smaller fractions are. So those two things need to be fulfilled before you even think of this working, right? So you can have a, 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 a rational expression and you might want to think, well, how am I going to integrate this? The first thing would be, it needs to be proper. And the second thing is I need to be able to uh, factor the denominator. If you can't do these, this is not an option you'd have to do something else, either a regular substitution, which you would have thought of before, or maybe a trig substitution if you have the right expressions. Um, so once you know that partial fractions can work, how do you actually do it? Well, we're going to go through these steps. So the step zero is to make sure the rational function is proper. And if not, make it so. It turns out that we can actually make it into a proper fraction if we don't have this in the beginning. And I'm going to show you some options on how to do that. Um, so at a glance, these are going to be the steps. You're going to make sure that the function is has a factorable denominator, and then you're going to factor it fully, right? So you're going to check. This is probably actually should be like a step zero, zero or something. Like the, the first two lines here, like you have to check them before you even start the technique, right? So you have to check these things. But after that, you're going to factor the denominator completely. That's our step two in this list, which I'll probably renumber these because that's kind of annoying. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to break up the larger fraction into smaller ones. The denominators are going to be the factors that you found in step two. And the numerator is going to be a generic polynomial of one degree less. I'm going to explain to you what that is later on. You should just know. Um, and um, 
If any factors are repeated, you're going to count up to multiplicity with those. I'm going to explain what that means. And it turns out now you'll have the large fraction equals this generic equation with smaller fractions. And so you're going to have some methods now where you find out the generic constants that you need to plug in. What arbitrary constants do you need to plug into the right side to make them equal to the left side? And there's an additional method that kind of gives you a shortcut in certain cases called the cover-up method, which I'm going to show you how to do um, that can help you in that. But these are essentially the steps. So if it's proper in the denominator factors and none of the previous techniques work, then you have the option to do a partial fraction decomp to break the bigger fraction into smaller ones. You would need to factor the denominator, break it into smaller fractions based on the denominator's factors, have some generic numerators with arbitrary constants, and then using this equation, figure out what those arbitrary constants are. And then the idea is all these little fractions that you figure out, they're going to be easier to integrate than the large cumbersome fraction. And um, depending on the situation, uh, sounds like a long process when I'm saying this, and sometimes it is, to be honest, uh, on the situation. You can actually break something down relatively quickly into some smaller guys. Like a, a problem like this shouldn't take you too much time at all. And by the time I get to the cover up method, you're going to realize that a problem like this actually happens really quickly. Um, and compared to what you would have to go through with a trig sub. But that's what we're going to essentially do. So when we come back, going to take another five minute break now we're actually going to start these so i'm going to have to go through each of these steps one by one in isolation so you fully understand what happens in each step and then we're going to start uh using this process to do integration but for now we are going to uh take another five minute break even though we got an extra one because of technical difficulties but we'll take a five minute break and when we come back we'll actually start this method uh, so I'll see you guys in a bit. All right, so let's uh, let's continue. This is the method. I, I, I renumbered it because it's kind of weird. So the step zeros are the guys that you have to check before you even do anything, because if these guys aren't fulfilled, then the method isn't going to work. So think of step one as being the first thing. Once you kind of check it, that it can work, um, you continue with these steps. So factoring the denominator completely and all that stuff. That being said, we do sort of have to talk about step zero, zero, right? Um, so uh, if you don't have a situation where there's a rational function, does that mean that this method will not work? Technically, no, not a in general, because there are ways you can go from something that's not a proper rational function to one that is. So I kind of wanted to go through each of these steps with you separately. And I just recopy the steps here. Um, let's go through each step. All right. So make sure it is proper, very important. If it's not proper, make it so. So there are two main ways you can actually do this. Uh, there are two main methods. Two main methods. to accomplish this. Um, one, why does it keep doing that? One, um, what I'm going to affectionately refer to as algebraic manipulation. And two, uh, actually polynomial long division. Which uh, 
seeing that some of you might like, have PTSD from pre cal class and start rocking your chair. Yeah, that polynomial long division that you learned in pre cal class um, can come in handy here. So I'm just actually going to show you some examples of these guys in action so you can kind of see what they are. And um, then we can move on. So let's look at some algebraic manipulation. Okay, so this means you algebraically manipulate the expression so that you can separate it and simplify uh, kind of on the spot. And um, the idea behind this, uh, I would say the main idea, uh, try to get the denominator in the uh, numerator, then split your fraction um, around it. How do you get the denominator in the numerator? Well, you do the math thing, you put it there. You want it there, so you just put it there. Of course, in math, when you put something there that wasn't there before, if you don't want to change the value of something, you kind of have to take it away again. So you're going to do this trick that you, I'm sure you've seen before, where you add and subtract something. Or you somehow, uh, you and by doing that, adding and subtracting something, if you can get the expression for the denominator in the numerator, that is actually going to be a shortcut for you in, in many cases. So let me show you an example of that at work. Um, example. Let's say we have the expression x squared plus one over x squared plus two, okay? So it is not proper because the highest power in the numerator is the same as the highest power in the denominator. We need the highest power in the numerator to be strictly less than the highest power in the denominator. So this is not proper, which means I can't even think about doing a partial fractions on this, um, which ignore the fact that I couldn't do it anyway because I can't factor the denominator, but I couldn't even, even think to do this here. However, here's one thing you could do. If I kind of focus my attention on getting the denominator in the numerator, what would I need to do? Well, um, my denominator is an x squared plus two. So what I can do is I can actually just put in a plus two so that I can get the x squared plus two just like it's in my denominator. However, there was no two in my numerator to begin with. So that means I have to minus two at the same time. So the goal is pretty much to just get the denominator. So here's your denominator that I now forced into my numerator, right? And I accomplish this by adding and subtracting something. So what essentially that is, this is like X, uh, I'm gonna write that down. So this is essentially X squared plus two minus one all over x squared plus two. And of course you can know that one is two minus one, but uh, you just force the denominator in there and then subtract what you need to, to get the thing to be what it was before. And now what you realize is you can actually split this fraction into two parts. You can now split it across this and across that. because fractions work that way, right? If you have A plus B all over C, you can split it into A over C plus B over C, right? And that's exactly what you would do. So this, you can split into X squared plus two over X squared plus two minus one over X squared plus two. And that way, this guy cancels and you just have one minus one over X squared plus two. Now this guy you'll notice is now a proper fraction. Okay. 
So that is the algebraic manipulation, right? You kind of force what you want into the uh, numerator and then um, you can do that by adding and subtracting something and then you can split. Um, let me give you a slightly more complicated example. Let's say instead of x squared and x squared, let's say I had like x cubed plus one over x squared plus two. So here I can one, think of this as x times x squared. And then what I could do is something like add the two, subtract the two, do that inside the parentheses. And so this would become x times x squared plus two minus two x plus one. And there I've just gotten my denominator as a factor in the numerator. And then I can split these two fractions now. So this actually becomes x times x squared plus two over x squared plus two minus two x minus one over x squared plus two. This guy cancels and I'm left with x minus that. And this, as you realize, is a proper fraction now. Right. So this is what I refer to as algebraic manipulation. I don't know if there's like a name for it, but I, I don't, I don't think there's like a name for it really. Um, but essentially you kind of try to force the denominator into the numerator by like adding and subtracting stuff and expanding. So anything now that has a factor of the denominator in the top, you can split the fraction among those and those guys will get all canceled. And you'll be left over because when you're factoring stuff out, you'll be left over after cancellation with something smaller in the, in the, nu in the numerator, right? So that's one way to actually get this done. You kind of do this kind of trick. Another way, if you don't see this, because you know this takes a little bit of insight, I guess, especially in a problem like this, x cubed plus one over x. Or, like, um, you might not see that the trick would be to first factor off an x and then within parentheses, add to that x squared two and subtract from two. The more straightforward way. So algebraic manipulation is kind of equivalent to like, seeing the triangle in your head so you can do the trig sub without doing the trig sub sort of thing. Um, but there's actually a more straightforward way to actually go about this, which is long division. So um, these things are, are uh, this topic is taught in pre-calculus. So I'm not really gonna go over it. Uh, you have my pre-calculus lectures. There's a link to them uh, in the syllabus. So you can review that if you want. Um, but I'm just going to show you an example here and hope that jogs your memory enough for us to move on. So go back to that x squared plus one over x squared plus two. Of course, this means you have um, uh, x squared plus one and you're dividing into that x squared plus two. Now, one thing you need to remember for polynomial long division is to set it up properly, you actually need to account for all powers of x descending. So you, actually writing this it out this way is actually not great. Um, you would actually need a placeholder for the x power. So there's going to be like a, a plus zero x plus one, right? You have to account for all lower powers. And so me taking x squared plus one divided by x squared plus two is gonna be this. And long division, how it works, 
is you're going to take the highest power here, divided into uh, what is it doing? Divide it into the first term. So you take x squared into x squared, you're going to get one as the answer. You're going to take that one, you're going to multiply both guys here, and you're going to put the result underneath this. So one times x squared is x squared. One times plus two is going to be plus two. And then you have to subtract that from the new the previous one. So x squared x x squared minus x squared, they die. And then you'd have one minus a two, you'd end up with a minus one here. Right? Now this minus one has no powers of x squared on it. So you can't actually divide x squared into this any further. So this ends up being the remainder. And so now we know the answer is going to be the quotient plus the remainder over the dividend. Not dividend, divisor. So in this case, the quotient is one plus the remainder is minus one over the divisor x squared plus one. So in other words, this is just one minus one over x squared plus one, which x squared plus two. Which you'll realize is what we had before. So this is like just doing regular long division, but with polynomials. Um, and the idea is you have to keep a remainder. Um, so a numerical example might make this make a little bit more sense. Let's say I wanted to take 27 divided by two. You think of this as two dividing into 27. What you do is you take the two divided into the two that goes one time. You take the one times the two, you get two, you subtract it, so that's zero, you bring down the seven. Then you take the two into the seven um, and the remain that goes three times. You take the three times the two, you get six, and then you subtract that. You would end up with one. Two does not go into one. So this guy is your remainder. And so the quotient is that number that's on top of the thing. So it's 13. So 27 over two is actually 13 plus one over two or 13 and a half, right? So you're kind of taking the same idea, but you're applying it to polynomials now. Um, and you can actually do that. So uh, just so we're clear with the names here. It's the divisor is the guy out here. The dividend is the guy under here. The quotient would be the guy that's up here. And after doing the thing, the remainder is what's gonna be left over here. And your answer is always gonna be quotient plus remainder over divisor. So it's going to be whatever's on top here plus this guy divided by that guy. And so that's polynomial long division. Um, let's do, I did have a couple more examples. Very similar to my second example, I have, uh, I did this one. So you have that guy and you know it's not a proper fraction. You're going to want it to become a proper fraction. So one, you can do algebraic manipulation. So that would be something like, I can factor out an X, I get X squared plus one in here. Okay. 
then I can have this x squared plus two minus uh, two plus one. And some of these steps you'll be able to skip in your head after a while. Um, so this is x times x squared plus two minus one all over x squared plus two. And you kind of keep this guy, move him around as if he's one guy. And so this would become x minus one over x squared plus two. Versus another method would be polynomial long division. That would look like x squared plus two. You want to divide that into x cubed plus zero x squared plus x plus zero. And so you take the x squared into the x cubed, divide x squared into x cubed, you get x. Take that x, you multiply everyone here you would get x cubed plus 2x. So I'm going to line that up with here, and then you subtract it. x cubed minus x cubed is 0. x minus 2x, you're left with negative x. x squared cannot go into negative x, so this guy is your remainder. So the answer is going to be the quotient, which is the guy on top x minus the remainder over the divisor. Wait, did I? Oh, this is supposed to be an x. Skipping steps, making mistakes. Actually, write out that stuff. Right, so one or of two of these methods you can do, and you can actually break this down. And you'll notice that the, the fraction that remains is actually a proper fraction. Right, the highest power in the numerator is smaller than the highest power in the denominator. So that's the first thing. And this is, I mean, was a very quick review, but generally speaking, I think you do stuff like this in your pre-cal class. I, I definitely did. So if uh, you know that some of this went too fast for you, I'd probably review pre-cal. I just want to do a little bit just to say I've jogged your memory and now we want to move on. So one, uh, make sure the function is factorable in the denominator. So once you have to make sure that it's a proper fraction, Okay, so it either it's going to be proper or you can make it proper using one of these two methods. Now, let's say you've done that. The next thing you're going to want to know is to make sure that the denominator is factorable and then you want to factor the denominator completely. Okay, and um, at this point, I think uh, I'm going to skip this because if you don't know how to factor polynomials, <laughs> that's something that we need to. Uh, um, look this up. Also, um, go up what's called the rational roots theorem. So that's something that helps you uh, factor. Um, help you factor polynomials where one of the factors isn't as obvious. You can try certain constants and then uh, based on what the rational roots theorem tells you, you can do a long division to sort of figure out what the factors are. Um, but yeah, review how to factor polynomials. Um, so I'm talking about the AC method, all that stuff. Um, and then 
uh, make sure you actually look up the rational roots theorem as well. So assuming you check that the denominator can be factored and you know how to factor it, then you should just factor it, right? And that's gonna be essentially the first step, right? So the other things is kind of like step zero. These are things that have to be in place before you even start. But the actual process of partial fraction starts by factoring the denominator of the fraction. Um, and I'm gonna assume you know that. Now, what follows is the actual breaking it into pieces, which is what I want to show you, right? So you're gonna break up the larger fraction into smaller ones where the denominators of the smaller fractions are really the, the factors that you got from step one. And what's going to be important is that the numerator has to be a generic polynomial of one degree less than the factor in the denominator. So I'm gonna explain what that means. So let's say we have something like five over X times X plus two. Okay. So here was a proper fraction. The denominator is fully factored, right? So what you're going to do is you're actually gonna break this up into two fractions where one, the denominator is the, that factor and the second one, the denominator is that other factor. Now, the denominator, these are one degree polynomials. Which means the numerator must be zero degree polynomials. The numerator must be one degree less than the denominator. Okay. Now, um, a zero degree polynomial is just a constant. So this basically means you're just going to write constants on top, A and B. Customarily, we use uppercase letters. Um, that's just traditional. Okay. And the A and B are just constants now. So A and B are arbitrary constants. that we will determine later. Okay, but that that's it. That's that's step two, part A. That's all, right? Once you get into the position where you factor the denominator, you're gonna break this up into smaller things. So I'll give you another example. Uh, let's say you had two over X times X squared plus one, okay? So I have this fraction, I factored the denominator. This cannot be, the denominator cannot be factored any further. What that means is I'm going to break this into two smaller fractions where each denominator in the factor is a denominator of the smaller fraction. Now, what goes on the numerator must be one degree less than the main factor in the denominator. So in the first guy, you'll notice that this is degree one, right? This is degree one, which means on top needs degree zero. This guy is degree two, which means on top you need degree one. You always choose one degree less than the denominator, right? Obviously it can't be the same because that's an improper fraction or larger because that's an improper fraction but you want one degree because you want the largest possible thing that it could be so that you get all the right constants. So degree zero is just a constant. So that's just gonna be A. Degree one looks like a linear function, right? MX plus B sort of thing. So here I can write BX plus C, right? So that's degree one. Right? Here's another example, just to kind of hopefully hammer this home. Let's say I factored the denominator and it says it's like X and there's X cubed plus seven, which I can't factor any further, right? I, I don't even have the sum of two cubes formula to help me here. I would break this down. One denominator would be X. The other denominator would be X cubed plus seven. This is degree one. 
which means the top needs to be degree zero. Here is degree three, which means the top needs to be degree two. It's always one degree less. So I want a generic degree zero polynomial on top of the first fraction. I want a generic de degree two polynomial on top of the second one, which means I need to have a constant on the first one and a quadratic on the second one. So A is going to be my arbitrary constant and BX squared plus CX plus D is going to be my arbitrary um, quadratic. Right. So this is what I mean by writing down a generic polynomial. You just write down a polynomial of the right degree, but you don't really know what the coefficients are. So you just use letters to represent them. Right. Finding out what the letters are is in a future step in the method, but this is where it all starts. Okay. So that's sort of the idea. Once you have the denominator factored, you're going to break it up into smaller fractions where each of the denominator factors are on one fraction. Then on top, you're going to write down a generic polynomial that's one degree less than the denominator. Is that, hopefully that's clear. Um, we can deal with that a little bit further in the next step. So let's just actually do that. Because the next step is something on top of this one. So, Occasionally, when you factor something, there are going to be repeated factors, right? And so you're going to factor something, but that factored thing might have a power on it. So it, it might have a repeated factor. How you deal with repeated factors is that you count up to the multiplicity. And I'm going to show you what that means. So for example, let's say I had this fraction. Um, so something like x times x plus 1, but that factor is squared. So the x plus 1 factor is repeated, right? There are actually two x plus 1s in the factors. And someone got kicked out. Okay, so x plus 1 gets repeated. How do I deal with that? I count up to the multiplicity. So one fraction is going to be x. The other fraction is going to be x plus 1. And I put a third fraction that's x plus one squared. If I had, say, just to kind of hammer this home, if this were cubed, I would count up x, x plus one, x plus one squared, and x plus one cubed. So for a repeated factor, I keep the base factor and then I literally count up from power one, power two, power three, power four, all the way up to whatever the highest uh, repeated factor was. Now, um, I did mention here that uh, the step is the base factor and the base factor is referring to the guy that's inside the parentheses. So the, I think of the denominator here as the x plus one, right? So this still means I need degree zero up here. Degree zero, degree zero, degree zero, degree zero. So this, it looks at, looks at the inner factor. So while technically this looks like a cubic, you shouldn't put a quadratic on top. You should actually put what's inside the factored, the base factor. And so here, this would just be A, B, C, D. Here you would have A, B, C. Um, now you might wonder why that is here. <laughs> So let, let me actually show you why that would break down like that. Why, right? Why do you kind of ignore the one degree less rule? You're not really ignoring it. Um, so here's the idea. If you started off with something like x plus one cubed, 
how you really think about this is you take x plus one cubed and the generic polynomial, you would just think sort of like when we're doing trig sub and we think of thought of the x plus two as the x, you kind of can do the same thing here. You think of this as a times x plus one squared plus b times x plus one plus c. So you, you do the generic quadratic on top, but you think of the variable as being x plus one. So when you start to actually break this down, you realize that this guy is gonna cancel that this guy is going to cancel that, leaving two. And so this would break down into a over x plus one, b over x plus one squared, plus c over x plus one cubed. So when there's a repeated factor, you literally just count up to the multiplicity. And the generic numerator is based on what's inside the parentheses. It's based on the base factor. Okay. So if you have a bigger fraction, there's a repeated factor in the denominator, you simply just repeat that factor and count the powers up to whatever the highest power was. Okay. So, um, I mean, any questions on this step? Like how to construct the numerator? What happens in a repeated factor case? Are we kind of clear on... Maybe I'll have one of you guys um, do this. So let's say I have five over someone tell me how that would break down. Maybe I'll make this a cube. I think you would so get. Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> who? <laughs> uh, who was that? It was two of us, but you can go ahead, Nadia. Nah, bro, you. If you insist, uh, okay. ax plus b over x squared plus c over x plus one plus d over x plus two plus e over x plus two squared. I, I changed this to a cube. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So e over x plus two squared plus f over x plus two cubed. Right. By the way, this uh, uh, you could write as a over x plus b over x squared, right? It, it, the x ha is a repeated factor itself. Right, ax plus b simplifies to that. So yeah, that uh, that would be the partial fraction. Okay, awesome. So that's like the generic thing. So now the next step is how are you going to find what the a, b, c, d, e, f are? Right. So it's like originally when we had actually, I'm I'm gonna actually uh, let's look at the motivating example. So there are uh, two main methods for finding these guys. Um, I would say the first method should kind of be your go-to. The second method you kind of use if you have to. And it might be the case where a mixing and matching of these two methods is actually the best way to go. So um, let's look at 
uh, method one. Okay. So method one involves when you break something down um, into this generic uh, breakdown here, you would multiply both sides by the denominator on the left. And then you plug in convenient values that eliminate as many variables as possible and leave you with smaller variables to solve for. So let me actually show you how that would work. So we started off looking at this guy, right? Which I, I you know, snarkily mentioned, oh, that's just one over X minus three. Blah, blah, blah. How do you know that? Well, let's say you wanted to do partial fractions. What would be the first step? Check that it's proper. If it's not, make it proper. Okay, it is proper. So we're good. Step one, factor the denominator. So you would factor the denominator. Hopefully you would know that that factors into X minus two times X minus three, right? X, you open two parentheses, you have X. Find two numbers, when you multiply them, you get positive six, add them, you get negative five. So you would get that. So then what you have is the original is this guy. You're gonna take that factored form and you're gonna write it as this. Now to find this, the first thing you would do, yeah, is multiply both sides by the denominator on the left. So I'm gonna multiply both sides by X minus two, three times X minus two. What you're gonna realize happens at that point is that you'll just have a one on this side and on the right side, you would end up with an A times X minus two plus a B times X minus three, right? Because when I multiply by X minus three times X minus two for the first fraction, the X minus threes cancel and you're left over with the X minus two. In the second one, the X minus twos cancel and you're left over with an X minus three. So now you have this linear equation. And here's the idea. I'm going to plug in convenient values for X that allows me to eliminate some variables and leave others, right? And I want to eliminate as many as possible and leave as few as possible for me to solve for. So looking at this equation, can you think of any convenient X value that would accomplish this? Three. Three. Notice that if I plug in X equals three, so this would be the next step. Plug in convenient values of X to get simpler equations. Um, convenient means eliminates um, as many constants arbitrary constants as possible leaving as few as possible to solve for. So notice that if I plug in X equals three, yeah, I would get one equals A times three minus two plus B times three minus three. This of course is zero. And I would be left with A equals one. Now I can do that again. Is there another convenient X value? And you'll say, oh, X equals two. That would allow me to eliminate the A and leave the B. 
So if I plug in x equals two, I would end up with one. Here it'll be two minus two plus the b would be two minus three. That guy's going to be zero. And so what I would end up with is one is equal to minus b, or in other words, your b is equal to minus one. So now I have found the constants. I can go back to my original, which is supposed to be a over x minus three plus b over x minus two. a over x minus three plus b over x minus two. So this is your a and this is your b. And so what I told you in the beginning of all this, that this guy is actually equal to that guy, like this is how you could discover that. Factor the denominator of the guy on the left, break it up into a over x minus three plus b over x minus two, plug in convenient, multiply both sides by the denominator on the left, plug in convenient values for x. I'll eliminate the a, solve for the b, eliminate the b, solve for the a, and you actually get what those numbers are. So now you can actually do that. And of course, this would mean If I wanted to integrate the guy on the left, it's actually the same as integrating the guy on the right. And the guy on the right is obviously a lot easier to integrate. Now, I'm going to quickly show you method two, and then we'll wrap up there. And I'll uh, maybe leave some examples for you to do. So we have like the one over x squared minus five x plus six, which we know we can factor the denominator. Get that. And then we know we can look at this guy. So before, what we did was we multiplied both sides by the denominator left, plugged in convenient x values to kill all the arbitrary variables except one, right? So now, um, the first step for this method is the same. So um, step one, same as method one. I'm going to multiply both sides by the denominator on this guy. So I have a times x minus two plus b times x minus three. Okay, awesome. What this method does differently now is it, it actually expands uh, the right side. and group like terms. So this means I multiply this out. Then I'm gonna group all the X's. and group all the uh, constants. Right. Maybe I'll put this minus in here. Minus 2a, minus 3b. 
and then here um, you're going to equate coefficients of like terms on both sides. This would yield a system of equations. that you can solve. So what would that look like? Notice that the, the left side here, one I can think of as the following. There are zero x's plus one on the left. And here I have a plus b x's plus this constant on the right. What that actually means is that zero must be equal to a plus b because the number of x's on the left has to be the number of x's on the right because this is an equation. You have to have the same amount of each thing on both sides. This also means that the constant over here must be equal to the constant over there. So one must be equal to that expression. So what you end up getting is you get a system of equations. Your a plus b must be equal to zero. And your minus 2a minus 3b must be equal to 1. So here you end up with a system of equations with two unknowns, two equations. And you just solve this using whatever you did, however you solve system of equations. So this is like uh, equation 1. That's equation 2. You know, in 1, your a is equal to minus b. Plug into 2. I'm using the substitution method here. Uh, so you have uh, 2 minus b minus 3b equals 1. This means you have um, uh, 2b minus 3b equals 1. This is minus b equals 1, so your b equals minus 1. This also means that your a equals minus b, so your a is plus 1. And so you found your a is plus 1, your b is minus 1. And you can throw that in. a is plus 1 over x minus 3, your b is minus 1 over x minus 2. And that's essentially partial fractions. Now, the cover-up method is like a shortcut that works sometimes, which I'll talk about, um, which I'll talk about next time. But these are the two main methods, and sometimes you mix and match. And you might wonder, well, why would I use method two? It seems like a lot harder. Well, there are times when method three, method one, there is no convenient x that eliminates people. Right? It's possible that you have an equation where no matter what you plug in, you can't kill everyone. Right. So at that point, you might want to start grouping like terms and doing this sort of analysis down here. But with those methods, um, one of these two, you can finish up that process. So what I did here, there are some examples here. Um, so this we'll talk about next time. Try the following examples. So, um, which actually might be very effective because you're going to realize that um, the trick that I give you, when you do it out the uh, potentially longer way, you're going to appreciate the cover up method a lot more. Um, but yeah, that's how you do a partial fraction decomposition. You have to remember how to factor. You have to remember like either polynomial long division or how to do that algebraic manipulation uh, to get something in the right way. Factor the denominator, break it up according to the how I told you to break it up here. And then um, to find the A, B, C, Ds, however many variables there are, 
use one of two methods. In, in a very specific case, a shortcut called the cover-up method can help you out, but that's just a special case kind of thing. Um, but these would be the two main ways to do it, which sometimes you can mix and match. Sometimes you can have, you can plug in some numbers to make, get zero out some of the variables. Uh, and then for the what's left over, you might want to try this method where you set up a system of equations to find the, the others. Um, so you can actually mix method one and two. But uh, we'll actually talk a little bit more about that next time. Um, note. Methods one and two can be mixed. But yeah, I would say try that and you can try these. I mean, there's some space between the examples here. But all of these are things that you can use uh, partial fractions to solve generally. Um, but yeah, once you actually break down, find the partial fraction decomposition of these. If you can get through example one, I'll be happy. Um, and we'll go through example two together, but actually try what I mentioned to you to actually break these guys down into their parts, find the A, Bs and Cs, and that would be a good place to pick up um, tomorrow. But all that's in the notes, you guys know where to find it. So with that, I would say we can, we can stop there. Um, it's ran a little over, but had technical difficulties, so uh, it was worth it. Um, with that being said, um, I will wish you all a good night. And um, yeah, try those examples. I'll see you guys on the next one.